our tour today is intended to be both eye-opening and reassuring. I hope that uh, folks that are listening and watching this will understand that it relates right back to them. And I think you probably spoke to this before I showed up. Whether it's a harbor wall, a building, or a house, you need to, you can make some uh, cost-effective improvements to ensure that in an earthquake of any magnitude that your investment will stay that way. If you don't, not many insurance companies actually pay for earthquake damage. So think of it as a, just like you pay your, you know, your property insurance premium. Uh, this great building here is an example of a public-private partnership with a nonprofit where we were able to help them build a new facility that helps strengthen this uh, very old brick and brick and mortar uh, facility. So when we looked at this existing building, there are kind of three goals we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to, one, make sure the building has overall earthquake resistance. Uh, two, we want to make sure that we strengthen the exterior, strengthen all unreinforced masonry walls, so URM walls, there's that acronym again, uh, whether it's interior or exterior, such that bricks don't start falling away from the building. And three, because these URM, unreinforced masonry walls, also providing bearing support or support for the floors and the roof, we also want to add a secondary, what we call secondary gravity support framing system. And what that does in the event that there's localized portion walls that say could collapse an earthquake, that it's basically a fail safe for the building. The building will not collapse. The Burnside Bridge was uh, chosen because it has been designated a uh, lifeline bridge for the community. And uh, the goal is to keep it operational after a large seismic event or some other type of emergency event. During an earthquake, this could be vibrated so hard that the uh, portion of the bridge that's on the expansion side could fall off its seats and then come down, uh, crushing whatever's underneath it. So the phase one upgrades put these tubes uh, through the vent cap. Uh, there's a large tube that comes through from the, the back side to us, and then a smaller tube that goes back through the other way. That tube allows the expansion and contraction to happen, but it has a retainer ring on it that prevents it from pulling off the bridge in the event that it's shaken. Uh, these upgrades were designed to uh, cur current seismic standards, so they're designed to survive a 500-year event, which is a very large earthquake. This fire station was built back in 1952, and it's a historic part of the waterfront area we have here, and it's response to over 6,000 emergencies per year on average. So what Dayton Club engineers did was we evaluated this building for the seismic performance. We wanted to make sure that it was going to be able to be used after an earthquake and respond to the rest of the area the community. So what we did first with the doors is behind each one of these walls on the first floor, behind the brick, we added additional concrete. And in one spot there was a door that used to be right here. This door used to enter into the, into the fire station, but we really needed a concrete wall there. So we put concrete in. The historic nature of this building meant that we needed to preserve the appearance. So we made a concrete door. Above that, you have windows, and it looks like you still have windows all the way across the building. That was an important view and important appearance of the building. Well, now behind a few of those windows are actually walls. We encase the columns that are behind some of these windows by walls, and you can tell which ones they are because they're the dark windows. And the last thing that I mentioned was the tower that wanted to sway around differently than the rest of the building. We added structural fuses, much like in your electrical box at your house, you've got a fuse. That fuse is designed so that you don't get electrocuted, right? It goes first, right before you do. In a building, we designed a fuse to control the way the tower swayed, how much it swayed away from the building and towards the building to control how much movement we had between them. So all of those things were done to allow the fire station to be able to do what it's supposed to do after an earthquake, not have to cut the doors open, not be stuck inside of a, a potentially collapsing building, and instead be able to help everyone else. Um, so, although it's it, uh, although everybody enjoys um, the benefits of living right on a river, um, there are also these liquefiable soils we need to be concerned about. Liquefaction is where loose sandy soils that are water saturated, when you shake them, they temporarily turn into a liquid. And if you have a structure that depends on that soil being solid, then it can be a problem. Uh, tanks that are buried can, because of the buoyancy forces, pop up, and structures can actually settle. And they don't necessarily settle uh, uniformly. They can settle in a way where they're distorted. 
if that were to happen, it's very likely that the utilities connecting up that building are actually severed as well. I have to say that of all the places I'd like to be if there was an earthquake, this is not too bad because I mean, if it fails, it's not a building, nothing's coming down on top of me. Am I missing something here? I mean, does it matter if the seawall isn't here, you know, later? Right. Um, oddly enough, the seawall is a remnant of a bygone era. It's a remnant of the 1930s, when shipping was more important and the port itself is more important. Now it's really a recreational asset. It holds up the park and for recreational shipping. And of course, Rose Festival, the fleet comes in, which is a port with tradition. So from that regard, it's an important asset when it comes to the uh, mental well-being of the city. I just want to say this is our kickoff. It's really uh, inaugurating what's going to be a month-long, two-month-long series of public events and displays in the Mercy Corps Action Center, exploring many of the same themes and some other implications for Portland and the Oregon community broadly. Uh, we're appreciative of the support of the city, Portland Bureau of Emergency Management, the U.S. Geological Survey, the Oregon Red Cross, and Mercy Corps, all bringing their particular expertise to this question of how do we begin to think about and build a resilient Portland, and we really have just begun. So thank you to you, May, for leading the tour today. Thank you to all of the speakers, and uh, thank you for all of you who participated and asked questions and captured the event. Thank you.